Well, welcome everybody to another session in our Women Lead webinar series brought to you by the Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas and I'm your host today and we are delighted to bring yet another informative webinar to our Association of Professional Women. Our Women Lead webinars are designed for you, the professional leader in business, whether you're an aspiring woman leader or a woman leading people or projects, teams or a company or a business. And we select topics and themes that support your goal to lead, achieve, and succeed more effectively in business. Now, our webinar is just shy of one hour, and we'll be answering any questions you've submitted online during the Q&A portion of our webinar. So the focus of our webinar today is the power of personal relationships. And my special guest with us today is Felicia Lyon of Women Moving Mountains. Let me tell you a little bit about Felicia. She is an accomplished executive leadership coach with 24 years of business experience. She brings a hands-on approach backed by leading practices that enables her clients to move from overwhelm to sustained high performance. And how many of us could say, yes, please tell us about that. Her passion for helping business leaders succeed led her to create Women Moving Mountains, an executive leadership coaching program for professional women leaders who want to get an edge in their career and improve their impact income and lifestyle. So without further ado, I am going to turn this over to our very special guest, Felicia Lyon. So take it away. Thank you. It's super exciting to be here with you all today. And now before we dive in, I'd just like to ask you to think about three different questions. The first is, do you get really excited to grab a stack of business cards and head down to the local networking meeting? <laughs> no. <laughs> now, do you keep a spreadsheet on your computer that when you meet someone, you write notes about them, you confirm the next time that you want to connect with that person in person? Now, who has a personal board of advisors that you actively engage with? So various answers to those questions every time I ask, and probably about 15% of the room when it's full of women actually raise their hands on those three questions. Now, for over two decades, I've served as an industrial psychologist across businesses and helping them improve on performance by focusing on the people side of the business. And when I had a, I had a simple goal when I was starting out, work for the top consulting firm, serve big companies, and have a big impact for those people in the businesses. And I was curious the other day, and I had a quick look back, just to look at the clients that I've helped. So there's two international governments in there, over a dozen Fortune 500. I've served two of the big four consulting firms. I've led five state government entities, and I've coached, mentored, and guided hundreds of leaders over that period of time. And if you look back and you look at a commonality across all of these companies and what makes them successful and helps them thrive, it's really when they have diversity of thought and driving the business forward. But as you can imagine, finding parity across those types of companies is no easy feat. Now, what I found out is that women and men approach business in very different ways. Men focus on the relationships they need to get ahead and in a very calculated fashion. Who can help them get, get, get what they want in their career? Now, women, on the other hand, we focus on building self-mastery. We are focused on building cohesion amongst our team, serving our clients with distinction. And I find often that women don't start looking for the next step in their career until they've satisfied, mastered where they are. So if you take a look deeper, you'll see that men are really good at building their networks. They champion each other, they mentor each other, and they hit each other up for after work events. And for a colleague of mine who runs a very successful executive placement firm, she estimates men spend about 25% of their time calculating their next move. 
looking and building stronger relationships that help them get ahead. Now, one thing I hear from women leaders is that they don't like networking because it feels transactional. They don't like having to talk about themselves. They don't often have enough time. And then they're the fact that they have spouses and children. And who just, they happen to be a lot cuter than hanging out at a networking event full of strangers, right? <laughs> but what if it didn't have to be so hard? What if you could be more purposeful in the relationships that you build? And what if those relationships can help you go further than you can imagine today and without sucking all of the extra time out of your life? So I like to always start with a little bit of data to create that compelling story, have you? Now Bloomberg conducted a study recently and they went back over a decade looking at comparison points on company performance. And an interesting point emerged when a company hired a female CFO in the first two years, those companies saw 6% increase in profit, 8% in stock return increases. And if you look at that cohort of women CFOs, they collectively brought in $1.8 trillion in cumulative profits. I would say that's a material impact, wouldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. All right, I have a sensitive mouth over here, mouse. <laughs> so, you know, if I can run more, one more study in front of you. if I can learn how to use my technology, is that the S&P Global undertook another study, and this time they look at the CEOs. And after the first two years of women CEOs versus male CEOs, women companies had a 20% increase in their stock price in their first two years. So that really is a compelling reason why women leaders need to stand up and be counted and strive for those larger positions. It's, it's just good business. Right. But why don't we have more diverse representation in the executive ranks? Well, it's not a pipeline problem, right? We're entering the workforce at the same rate, but it's become a pathway problem where we have women dropping off at every single level that leads up to that executive trait. And I'll remind you going back to that, we play the game differently from men. And a common trait one with our leaders is that we let our work speak for itself. We think if we do an excellent job, we'll get paid what's fair, and we'll get promoted when we're ready. But quite frankly, that way of thinking is broken. We must do something differently if we're gonna change the conversation for women in leadership. Now, if you look at the next layer of this study done by McKinsey, and looking at the perceptions of why women aren't getting ahead, and you'll see a reoccurring theme around sponsorship. Different standards, for men and women at work, and then the qualification gap. Now, I would argue that by taking the reins of your career and building the relationships that matter, creating sponsors who will advocate for you and help you get access to the types and skills and opportunities that you need to get ahead. So in looking at that, there's two different things that women leaders need to get an edge in their career. One is that personal board of advisors that advocate for us as individuals and help us play the game we're in. And also to be connected to multiple hubs of networks. And this is access to jobs, information, candidates for our own teams and referrals and all the while supported by a core inner circle of other powerhouse women. So let's meet Denise. Denise walked into my office one day just completely exacerbated. You can just imagine she sat down with this kind of cloud of frustration hanging over her. She mentioned that she was just so tired of being mentored. She'd been in her company for nine months and everyone she meet was full of advice, always willing to chat over a cup of coffee and give them their opinions. But what she was feeling was is that she needed some more sponsorship, someone that would actually lean in and help her in her career and help her navigate through the organization better. Now, what does that mean as far as board of advisors and mentorship versus sponsorships? So mentors have ch casual check-ins, right? Over a cup of coffee, give you some advice, share a thought with you. 
but as a sponsor, it's someone who will take charge of your professional experience and they will advocate for you even when you're not in that room. So let's take a look at Denise's situation. She's been in corporate communications for over 20 years. She's an expert in her domain. That's why they hired her. She was doing all the right things to get to know the leaders in her organization, learning the norms and unwritten rules. But many of her executives were just full of advice and counsel, but not willing to champion her. So here's what Denise and I worked through. We sat down to be more strategic on what her ask was. You know, who did she need to have strategic alliances within her business? Who was willing to make strategic connections for her, for her internal clients? And thinking through her next move when she wanted to get ready for promotion, who was going to vouch for her? Who was going to sing her praises when she wasn't in the room? And then the biggest thing, though, in thinking about who's on your board is being clear about what you want. It's hard to ask others to advocate and sponsor you if they're not clear on what it is that you want out of your career. And even worse, if you think about it, if you don't tell them what the career is that you want, they might tell you what the career is and you end up running, you know, a part of the business that doesn't actually empower you and make you feel excited to come to work every day. Mm -hmm. So I challenge you to think through these seven questions on building your personal board and take out a piece of paper and write down who fills those slots in your board. Are they in your current organization? Or are they outside, right? Someone maybe that has similar life circumstances of you that's working in a sister business, someone that can counsel you on how to show up as the powerhouse woman, knowing that your kids are at, at the really cool field trip that you wanna be in, but you have a really important deadline to meet. So who can help you maneuver in those situations and give you the right support and guidance that you need? Now, I don't want you to worry about having a direct relationship with each and every person on the board. It's not meant for you to have to go sit one-on-one -on -one with them each week to have this level of sponsorship. And also that your board should evolve as your career evolves. Once you eat, reach each new milestone, your board needs to be representative where you're going and the advocacy that you need to get to that next level. And for that reason, I often suggest that you don't actually tell people that you're on their, they're on your board. Because how awkward would that be if you went in and said, well, you know, Shirley, I really appreciate you being an advocate and sponsor for me, but with this next leg of my career, I'm gonna replace you with someone else on my board. <laughs> Not a very fun conversation, right? So you can engage and interact with people on your board, even from afar, without having to formalize that relationship. This is a really great differentiation between the idea of a mentor and a sponsor, because they are two very different roles. And when you mentioned making sure that they know what you want instead of what they see for you, because a mentor will see where they think you should be going, whereas a sponsor is, is promoting you and advocating for you. So this is a great differentiation. Yep, that's exactly right. You, you have in the driver's seat with your board of advisors, you know, helping you get there. It's great, great observation. So next I'd like to introduce you to Carrie. Now, Carrie is another powerhouse leader that takes pride in her work, and she sees it as a personal responsibility to bring her A-game each and every day. And Carrie worked at one of the largest consulting firms. Uh, she showed up every day. She worked late, much later than her bosses and her male colleagues. She decided not to join the team for after-work drinks because she was, you know, working late and then just too tired at the end of the day and wanted to get home to her husband and kids. Carrie noticed the guys were getting chummier by the day and her boss would sit around and shoot the breeze with the guys instead of getting work done. And after a year or two, Carrie started to notice how the guys on her team were rising through the ranks much faster than she was, even though she knew her capabilities were much stronger. It wasn't long before Carrie started resenting her colleagues, her boss and her overall company. Did they not see the impact that she was having on the business? 
why wasn't she getting promoted? She was the one working till six, six thirty every night. And then one day Carrie had enough. She turned in her notice and started looking for her next job. Now fast forward to Carrie today, after several positions in several different businesses, Carrie finally had a real epiphany. She was so busy doing her job, she wasn't fostering the, relation, the relationships that would help her get more success. And instead of having constructive conversation with her leaders, she made assumptions about the guys club. It wasn't that the guys were sitting fluffing off work. They were being strategic about the relationships they needed to get in ahead in their career. And now she sees these conversations that they, they were having, they were more about coaching and getting advice and counsel on how to get ahead. Carrie only wished she would have had that epiphany early in her career as it would have saved her from frustration, sacrificing family time, and jumping from company to company. Now you might be able to see yourself in Carrie's story. Women focus on mastering where they are. We operate under that premise that if we do an excellent job, our leaders will notice and ask the, us to enjoy the next level. But we know it's not true or else we would have more parity in the number of women's leaders and women's pay for that matter. Now I often hear from my clients that they're not good at networking, they don't know what to say, they don't know how to self-promote without feeling braggy or feeling like a used carsman. But here's a few th tips that I've learned from the women that I've worked with and grown from over my career. It's, if you focus on building the relationship instead of networking, you'll make it a meaningful experience and you'll connect on a more personal level. It's really not about the number of business cards you collect, it's the number of memorable and meaningful conversations that you have. So I'll share a few more tacticals here. So my good friend Catherine approaches networking as she would a backyard, backyard barbecue. She comes in with a curiosity about the people she'll meet and she aims to have simple conversations that help her get to know people in a casual way. And whoever has a bad time at a barbecue anyway. <laughs> Another strategy is opting for a shared experience. You know, I found myself in the, a new business community in San Diego myself. And so I listed the help of two colleagues and we combined our network to build an invite only wine club where we meet once a month. We enlisted the help of a master sommelier and she walks us through a beautiful learning experience each month and helps us build deeper relationships together over a nice glass of wine. You know, in today's world, social media and staying connected online has become the norm. And it's a great tool to keep up with everything that's fun in everyone's life. But to build and grow authentic relationships, there's nothing better than in-person interactions. So finding opportunities to keep connected in the real world really makes a big difference. And, you know, a lot of our networks, we're, we're global now, right? We have friends and family all over the US, all over the world. And so one strategy a few colleagues of mine that love to use is they'll use FaceTime and Zoom and they'll have virtual coffee and virtual wine meetings just to stay connected and to make that eye contact and see each other. Um, there's other ways to think about networking, right? Look for collaborative partners. So Marlisa loves to pr partner with her clients after her projects are done. What they do is they create a case study that they present at the annual Black Belt Six Sigma conference. This helps her keep the relationships strong way after the client's project is done. And then when they're at the event, they're not on the stage by themselves, right? So it makes it more comfortable. And then they're able to tag team building more deeper relationships with everyone at the conference just from being on the stage. Hmm. Another opportunity is to think about our volunteer time. How do we pay it forward? And Suzanne is a great example here. She volunteers with a local organization made up of retired CEOs. They provide pro bono consulting to early stage businesses. And by applying her skill sets in a unique way, she's able to build deeper relationships with these CEOs who now refer her to new clients. And then those clients within the consulting organization are newer CEOs that help her expand her spider web of influence. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, thinking through your inner circle. There's an interesting study that came out of Northwestern School of Management last year, and they found that women with a close inner circle of one to three other women were able to get two and a half times higher levels of authority and pay than their peer group that didn't have that inner circle. So as you're thinking about your close relationships, I encourage you to think of both men and women to help you get where you need to go. And then last but le not least, thinking about one to two non-work communities that you can be involved in. Because at the end of the day, sometimes you wanna go find something more interesting, like a Make-A-Wish Foundation where you're helping kids achieve their dreams that can help you have a great end of your day after a long day in the office. Those now, are great tips. All of those are really, really good. Good. I'm glad, I'm glad they're resonating. Yes. Now, I know what you're thinking, though. How on earth are you supposed to carve out even more time in your day to focus on your board of advisors, to be more authentic in the relationships you're building? And on top of your broader network, oh, by the way, you need that inner circle, too. But let's talk about how you can get more time back in your life while you do build the relationships that matter. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to Cynthia, who has been mastering this for, for years. Now, Cynthia is a standout in any crowd as 6'3", who loves to wear beautiful high heels in her networking meetings. She stands out and makes a memorable impression when she enters the room. But what she's remembered by is the relationships that she matters, right? And she is also a, mo a single mom and highly active in her community. So you really wonder how she does it all. Cynthia's trick though, is to create three ring binders for her business cards. And based on her secret formula, she adds people to binders, A, B, or C. Um, she looks at that, what are their values as it relates to hers? And then, of course, she adds the fun factor, too, is if people that she wants to actually hang out with as well as do business with. And so she looks at how do they connect with her goals, with her career, with her business, with her family, and she puts them in the binders in that way. And now how Cynthia does that is she follows up on a schedule. So she looks at her A's monthly. She looks to connect with her B's quarterly and her C's twice a year. And now with being a busy, busy, busy mom, she also plans her networking schedule as she would with any other strategic work effort. In fact, she can't get on her, you can't get on Cynthia's calendar quicker than three weeks out unless there's something really unique that you need because she saves time for her daughter and her own self-care in that schedule. And she leaves open space on her schedule as well because things in life just happen, right? right. The other thing that Cynthia is really good at is creating these shared experiences. She will look for different events where she can get as many people of her network in one room. So she's done a booth at a like, local baseball game. Um, she's done opening night at her daughter's favorite movie. And so she's created a real strategic way of looking at her career and her relationships and layered her work and her life into it. Now, each of us are different and we have to find a way that works in our own lives. Um, and what I've got next for you is thinking about your relationship map. And just giving some guidelines when you start thinking about how frequently you should be spending time. So starting with your inner circle, thinking about how you meet bi-weekly bi and monthly, interacting with your personal board about monthly, your broader network once a quarter, and then your extended network once every six months. So that'll give you an anchor of a timeline. And then based on your own career goals and life goals, then you'll be able to flex that as you need to. So when you're thinking about who goes in each circle, I'll go back to six questions to think about asking yourself who goes in your relationship map. It's like who, who's in your peer group, you know, who focuses on your area of expertise that you want to have that relationship with who are leaders at different levels in your organization, right? It's not just looking, managing up, it's managing across and it's managing down. 
um, looking at other avenues in your business. So maybe you have an office over in DC, who's there that should be in your relationship map. And then as you think about who is on your list, also ask who's not, right? What, what are some of the struggles that you have in getting ahead and reaching your goals that knowing a certain type of person would help you get there better? And how do you fill that gap? One of my favorite questions, like the power of no, is who's in your network that may, maybe should not be in your core network, right? I always like to liken this story to family. It's like you love your family, but you don't necessarily want to spend every waking moment with your family and you have to create space um, for in-laws and you know cousins and everything. And they're still important to you. So they'll be in your more extended network category, but it's something that you wouldn't stress over about having to have a deep, meaningful relationship or a conversation every week. Mm -hmm. Now, to keep it manageable and sustainable, I do recommend my clients keep a spreadsheet with a contact information um, of everyone in their network on that sheet. And then put calendar reminders when it's time to reach back out to folks. Because it, you know, work gets in the way, life gets in the way, and being more on a solid cadence helps you stay top of mind with people that matter to you and matter to your career. Again, spending more time with those in your A and B category like Cynthia versus your C's and focus on building the quality with a few core individuals versus being everything to everybody. Another way to think about when you're building relationships is you know, creating your elevator pitch and being able to share what your unique you statement is as you go to different events to make those right connections. And the biggest reminder that I can have is that you don't have to do this alone. Build relationships that matter. People that make you smile, bring joy to your life. Um, remember to nurture and love your inner circle. And remembering that you have the power to say no when you need to. And the fun fact of thinking through your relationship map is what I call the R factor. Now, you know, networking is a dirty word. And so I continue to use the word relationship instead. But then as you think about your relationship map compared to everyone else's relationship map, we get to a more, a more interesting conversation. If you remember the old cliche of seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, now I'm thinking about reaching out. You have all of these different relationships to tap into in your relationship map to get you to interesting people that can make a difference in your career and your life. And now I mentioned as earlier a bonus of your unique you. Okay, so going back to your unique you, it really is your competitive advantage of being able to share your story in a way that highlights the impact that you have. And one of the biggest things I, I find is the intimidation around feeling braggy. It's like, I, I don't wanna brag about myself. I want to be authentic. And so I've been working with a lot of um, personal branding experts over the years. And so I've come up with a, a quick four questions to help you think about your unique you statement. And it's turning it, the lens off of you and onto those you serve. So whether you're internal and corporate or if you're on your own business, no matter where you sit, you have someone that you help. You help them face a particular problem. And in your unique you statement, you want to share with the individual you're meeting how you help this individual face that problem and what are the outcomes that you guide them to have. And using this income to out, outcome orientation helps you create a statement that's about how you serve and not you as the individual. And I found a lot of folks find this helps them get the courage to go up into a complete stranger and introduce themselves in a new way. Yeah, that, now, that's a really good point. And, and I've heard um, people say that that sort of changed the game for them, especially when it came to 
like a networking event. If instead of what can I get out of this, what can I bring to it? How can I serve others? Yep, exactly right, exactly. So in closing, if you'd like to know more about Women Moving Mountains, please find us online. You can reach out to me directly at feliciaLionPS.com. And if you're interested in more tips like this, we have the Women Accelerated Bootcamp launching in January. And the Power of Personal Relationships is part two in that seven-week course. So I'd love to have you join us and feel free to reach out on any social medias that we have. And so now I'd like to ask what questions you might have. Well, you know, one, one question that came in, Felicia, is um, the idea of managing your, your network. Um, the more that we put ourselves out there, the more that we're meeting uh, people who are influential and so forth and showing up as an influential woman, how do you manage the people that reach out and say, hey, could I have coffee with you? I'd love to pick your brain. And, you know, it seems like pick your brain is always sort of a code word. Um, and you book up, you know, uh, just a few of those and there goes your schedule, there goes your month. So how do you manage that sort of ranking those, um, those requests and those relationships? That's a very great question. Thank you for asking. I think it goes back to first being clear on what you're looking for, right? And understanding if this person fits into your plan and understanding, you know, are, are you getting something out of the conversation as well as giving something? Are they bringing something interesting to the conversation other than just pick your brain? Mm -hmm. um, are they you know, somewhere connected in the community where there's a mutual advantage there, thinking about working collaboratively with an individual. And oftentimes what I've seen that works really well is initial conversations just on the phone, right? Everyone's busy in the day and taking time to drive out of the office to get to coffee. That can requ require an extra half an hour of time commitment in an already time crunch day. Yeah. So setting up the initial phone call via phone to find those connection points, to find the, the reasons to add this person to your relationship map, have you, and then decide what, where to go from there. And sometimes it is politely declining, mm -hmm. right? Just because someone makes the ask doesn't mean that you have to say yes. And you can politely decline saying, hey, I so appreciate you reaching out. Right now, I have a few deadlines that I need to get after, you know, perhaps check back with me in, in a month, in four weeks after I get through a timeline. People understand that we're busy and that there's always more, you know, demands for our time than there are time. And so just being bold and being saying and saying how you would want to show up and be treated yourself if someone needed to politely decline as well. Yeah, that's good. That's really good advice. Um, here's another one is how do you show up, how do you prepare to show up at an event? Um, what are some of the things that you do before you go to a special event or a networking event to get yourself ready and be prepared to make the best use of your time there? Mm -hmm. Great question. So if I can, I like to get my hands on who else is going to be there. Mm -hmm. And if I can't get access to the actual list of participants, I think about who would be in the room and think about who I would want to meet in that room and go with the eye of curiosity of who's there and, you know, would have an interesting conversation. The other piece I think about is how do I want to show up? And I go through my mind of kind of what I call my five adjectives of, you know, being courageous, to be friendly, to be um, happy to be curious and going through that kind of mental mantra about how I want to show up helps me get my mind in the right frame of reference to walk into the room. And then I practice my unique use statement, mm -hmm. right? If I'm going to a group of HR professionals, 
my unique use statement might change a little bit versus if, versus if I'm going to a meeting with a bunch of business owners and thinking about how I'm showing up in a way that and that they understand in their frame of reference so that I'm creating a common sense of connection in that in that unique view statement mm -hmm. and then last I just remind myself to have fun <laughs> you know because it is about being authentic and building deeper relationships and it's okay if I meet one person that I have a really good conversation with and we end up, you know, sharing a story over a glass of wine and I don't meet five other people. I'm okay with that as long as I'm having a meaningful, fun conversation with one person. Yeah, yeah. That's a good way to look at it. That's a really good way to look at it. Um, how would you go about um, making a connection with somebody? Maybe there's someone that you've not, you haven't had the opportunity to meet them at a networking event. Uh, or at a, an industry event, any, any of those opportunities, but it's somebody that you know uh, you want to get close to, that somehow you want to begin to build some sort of a professional relationship with. How would you go about that? Yeah, that's a great one. And the first thing I start out by looking at is who do we know in common? Mm -hmm. Who could make a warm introduction um, that I'm not putting a cold call into someone and, and feel like a, a used car salesman have you. Yeah. And so I try to find that common person to make that connection. Now, if that, I don't have a common person, then what I'll do is I'll try to understand what that individual is interested in. So for example, there is, you know, a lot of information on LinkedIn today and there happens to be this one uh, woman leader in LA who runs the female quotient and I think she is the bee's knees for changing the conversation of women in leadership we don't have anyone in common but my message to her is I so appreciate what you're doing we share a common platform here's a tidbit of how I could add value to a conversation to something that you're working on would you be open to you know a 15 minute quick phone call Mm -hmm. And then being that bold and offering something of value of why she should be, want to meet with me as well, right? Because right. there is a two-way street and a relationship. So while she's a rock star, there are some things that I can bring to the table that she may not have and she may need herself. Yeah. I like, that's a really good, um, really good coaching there is because you're, you're not appearing as the needy uh, mm -hmm. grabbing person. It's we're we're peers. We're on the same level. This is something I I believe we could do for one another. I think it could be mutually beneficial. So that's a that's really good. Plus, it kind of builds you up in your own um, mind as far as giving you the confidence to make that outreach. You know. Yeah, absolutely. You deserve to have a conversation with interesting people because you're interesting, right? right. And, and not being afraid to own your unique you. Yeah, good. So what are some no-nos maybe? Um, maybe that you've seen some of your clients do, or maybe you know you have done it yourself in the past and learned from it, but what are some, some faux pas maybe to avoid when you are trying to build those personal relationships with people? I think the first one is showing up as the chatty Kathy yourself, mm -hmm. right? And wanting to impress upon them that you're at it, you're able to add value to a conversation. And the reverse is true is showing up as a curious cat with questions that you ask people to get them to talking about themselves and then letting that guide the banter of the professional conversation, right? Because the, people don't want to necessarily sit down and talk to someone that doesn't stop, right? People like to be heard, they like to be listened to. Yeah. And so you coming from that place of curiosity will say, oh, this person is interested in me. Okay, let me, let me pay attention, let me learn more about them as well. And so it creates that foundational element for the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think another thing I see a lot of is, oh, let me give you my card. And it's like shoving the business card in the hand and that's it. 
Yeah. Um, I've, I've had, I've got a, I can't throw them away for some reason, but I've got a stack of business cards that people just kind of give to your hand in passing at a networking event, but yet don't bother to make a meaningful connection. Mm -hmm. And I, I just have a, I have a stack of the ones that, you know, have a meaningful connection and then a stack that don't. And it's the funniest thing that I can't get rid of them, but, the, but the stack that, you know, don't make meaningful connections was tends to be a little bit higher than the meaningful ones. Right. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> if we're looking at a card, I don't remember this person. I don't know anything about them. So clearly there wasn't a meaningful conversation that came out of it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Great. Well, Felicia, I just want to thank you for spending so much of your valuable time with us today. This has been incredibly informative. And I, I just encourage um, our, our listeners to reach out. I'm going to go back to your connection slide here. This is the way that you can reach Felicia. And feel free to reach out to her and take advantage of her upcoming boot camp. And for all of you that are listening here online or who listen to this in the recording later, I just want to thank you again for being a part of this today. Thank you, Felicia, for sharing your wisdom and your, your know-how with us. And look forward to seeing you all on our next Women Lead webinar. So stay tuned. These are designed for busy women, busy professional women like all of us. And we look forward to seeing you online again very soon. Thanks again. Thank you.